I've always thought that the best, weirdest, most insane and imaginative fiction is the stuff based in reality. Series like JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Grappler Baki, and of course Metal Gear Solid take real-life history and phenomena, find the most unbelievable and amazing parts of both, and crank them up to 11. Take, for instance, a polygon man taking on the entirety of the invading Soviet army in Afghanistan. Speaking of, can you beat Metal Gear Solid 5 as Solid Snake? Alright, so what are the rules of this challenge run? Well, basically, I'm going to be running through this game like Metal Gear Solid 1. So, of course, I'm going to be playing as Snake and wearing the Solid Snake outfit gained as a special bonus for completing certain tasks in Metal Gear Solid 5 Ground Zero. But to play like I'm playing Metal Gear Solid 1, we've got a couple more restrictions and a couple of limitations. So first, no vehicles or buddies allowed during missions. For those of you that haven't played the first Metal Gear Solid game, and don't worry, I'm right there with you, you don't have access to any vehicles to use in Shadow Moses, the place where Metal Gear Solid 1 takes place, and there are no buddies to take on missions with you in the first game. I think I used a vehicle once for a couple of seconds, but it wasn't during a mission and resulted in an immediate crash. So it wasn't really that important, and every mission save for one, I flew solo, and that single mission was one where I was forced to take a buddy, so whatever. Anyway, on top of that, I only have access to weapons and items from Metal Gear Solid 1. I was going to write to weapons and items that Snake used in Metal Gear Solid 1 in the script, but we run into an issue with that later on in the run, so just know that other than that one instance, it's specifically only weapons and items that Snake used in Metal Gear Solid 1. So the weapons and items we can use during this run are as follows. The SOCOM, the FAMAS, Grenades, the Nikita Rocket Launcher, C4, Stun Grenades, Chaff Grenades, Diazepam, a Mine Detector, Cigarettes, the Cardboard Box, Night Vision Goggles, Thermal Goggles, a Gas Mask, a Scope, the Infinite Bandana, the PSG-1, Ketchup, Cold Medicine, a Rope, a Stinger, Body Armor, Rations, the PAL Key, a Disc, the Security Card, Stealth Camouflage, and a Tuxedo. So obviously we can't access all of these as some aren't even in the game or can't be used with other pre-established rules, like there's no chaff grenades in the game that I'm aware of. And while both the Infinity Bandana and Tuxedo are featured in Metal Gear Solid 5, they can't be worn in tandem with the Solid Snake outfit. And that takes priority in this run for obvious reasons. What we end up with as our arsenal for this run is the SOCOM pistol, a Geist P3 modified as outlined in Target Master's video, link in the description down below, a FAMAS assault rifle, which is a G44K modified as outlined in Target Master's video, frag grenades, the Killer B rocket launcher in place of the Nikita and the Stinger missile launchers, C4, stun grenades, diazepam, or as it's been renamed due to copyright infringement, pentazamine, phantom cigars replacing cigarettes, the cardboard box, night vision goggles, a scope in the form of the Int scope, the PSG-1 sniper rifle, an AMMRS-71 rifle modified as outlined in Target Master's video, body armor, which I think is included in the sneak suit Snake is already wearing in his MGS model, and stealth camouflage, though I never end up actually using it. So, skipping the most boring fucking mission in the universe where you get 40 minutes of cutscenes, followed by playing as me the day after jumping into a Jack's Blade workout routine. I'm gonna go get my boy, Master Benedict Kazuhira Miller. So we start the run in a sandstorm watching Troy Baker talk to a PlayStation 1 Polygon man, while said man fails to grab a flask from Troy, probably because of his Minecraft-ass fingers. He proceeds to pour the water all over his face without opening his mannequin mouth, and we're off to the races. I immediately abandon D-Horse, since I'm not allowed to use buddies, and begin charging forward to save Kaz. After sneaking into this Soviet base, I learn where Kaz is being held and head there to rescue him immediately. I pop a pentazamine and start picking off Soviets, and then I reunite with my number one homie, Kaz. He doesn't seem to recognize me, probably due to the combination of his cataracts and my low-res face, but regardless, I scoop him up and make out like a bandit. I desperately slam every button on my controller to respond to Kaz's prompting me to say, Kept you waiting, huh? 
But alas, I couldn't remember which button to press and accidentally ghosted my boy. The skulls show up, and at first I try to sneak past them by first hiding in a cardboard box and letting them pass, but that didn't work because the box timed out, and I tried to book it, but that failed miserably. Next, I baited the skulls to follow me one way and juked them out, then successfully snuck past them. No D-horse for me, thank you very much. Cause as non-flashbacks of being played like a damn fiddle! And I move on to my next mission. A Hero's Way sees me eliminating a Spetsnaz commander, so I thought this was a perfect opportunity to blow him away with a dose of pentazamine and a shot from my PSG-1. This failed horribly. After pulling off a full frontal assault against this fortress with my PSG-1, I finally offed the commander and exfiltrated. Next was C2W, where I had to blow up some comm equipment. I thought this would be easy as I had plenty of C4 and grenades. <laughs> After the third mission, where I expected things to go swimmingly only to be met with failure, I was beginning to sense a pattern of betrayed expectations. I tried going loud and died immediately, so this time I just went nuts with grenades, seeing as the soldiers with body armors and helmets were the primary problem, and the grenades would take care of both them and the comms equipment. That didn't work either, thanks to a gunship mowing me down right before I exfiltrated the hot zone via wormhole Fulton extraction on a cargo container. But, ironically enough, that death stopped me from making a mistake. I guess this is the best time to mention this, but this falls under one of those limitations I was talking about before. Since Fulton Extractions weren't in Metal Gear Solid 1, I was originally going to ban it, but due to the open-world nature of Metal Gear Solid 5, Fulton Extraction is kind of an integral gameplay mechanic. So rather than outright banning it, I decided to limit it as much as possible. Add to that, if I'm banning my Fulton tool because it's not in Metal Gear Solid 1, I'd have to ban my iDroid tool too, and that just ain't gonna work, so exceptions were made. Air support and bombardments from Pequod and Queequeg are also limited, but that won't become relevant for a while. So, running it back under the mindset of slow is smooth, smooth is fast, I dropped the welcome committee and decided to rely more on C4 and discretion than grenades and aggression. I was almost spotted, but after drawing their attention with some explosions, I was able to blow up the last comm, sneak away, and move on to the next mission, over the fence. The goal of this mission was to rescue a Soviet hand prosthetic scientist who wanted to turn. After taking a little smoke break, I snuck into the Soviet's base at the crack of dawn. Despite my deft maneuvering, I was caught by a Soviet that apparently had x-ray vision and, after trying to stun grenade my way out of a corner, I was shredded to pieces by a hail of shotgun shells. Round two, I made it back and put a couple of guys to sleep before nabbing me a guy for hand jobs. Wait, no, I meant... I meant... because he's a hand prosthetics guy? God dang it. Well, off to a rough start with Where Do The Bees Sleep. I got through half the mission only for my power to randomly cut out, causing me to lose all the footage I had recorded up to that point. All's not lost, though, as I only got halfway through the mission at that point, so you guys still get to see the absolute shitfest that is my trying to get this damn rocket launcher. Quickly and stealthily, I picked off people from the camp one by one, and even though the PSG-1 doesn't have a silencer, by using the cover of darkness and staying low and mobile, I'm able to evade detection. Unfortunately, a brief scuffle leads to my untimely demise, so I run it back. Back through Samase Fort, same strategy this time to a much better result. After a brief conflict involving stun grenades, I made my way down into the cave after rescuing the hostage and got the honeybee, which also counts as our Nikita Stinger replacement, though more on that later. The XOF rolls through, the OG team of Psychomantis, Skullface, and Sahelanthropus, and then I get jumped by the Skulls. With my FAMAS being a four-star weapon, defeating the Skulls and exfiltrating without even needing to use the honeybee is actually pretty easy. I could have used it due to it counting as a Nikita Stinger replacement, as mentioned prior, but there was no need. Next we got Red Brass, where I zip into a Soviet outpost and off three Soviet commanders. It literally took like six minutes and four of those was me running to and from the outpost. This mission just being another example of the 90% filler of Metal Gear Solid 5, and I say that being a super fan of Metal Gear Solid 5, like probably a plus 100 hours fan. I busted out the Killer Bee for Occupation Forces, where I rushed my way into the base and used a combination of the FAMAS and grenades until getting to the location of the upcoming tanks. As I'm writing this, I remember dying or failing once, and I'm eager to see how I managed to pull that off. <laughs> this attempt, I make use of my time and plant C4 before firing my Nikita at them to perfect effect. And that's pretty much the end of it. 
I bring the killer bee for backup back down too, and I pretty much just chase down the first vehicle and blow it up with missiles and grenades, and then periodically set C4 on the road all vehicles have to take to exit the hot zone to blow up the vehicles when they get to the mission exit area. By the end of it, I was out of C4, out of grenades, and out of killer bee ammo, so I didn't bother with the bonuses, but I had just enough of everything to complete the mission and dip. For Angel with Broken Wings, I went back to the PSG-1, thank you, Sniper Wolf, and tried to save this Mujahideen guy before the vehicle took him to wherever the fuck he ends up. The first time, I tried to exfil him with the vehicle, which didn't work and resulted in the fucking tank thingy running him over. Next, I tried the universal solution, C4. It almost worked until the tank shot at me and killed the fucking hostage. Third time's the charm, because this time, instead of using the C4 as a way to stop the truck, I use them to blow up the tank, which causes the truck to stop. Galaxy brain play, a couple of tack takedowns, and a truck exfil later, and I got the man out of there. In Cloaked in Silence, I outsniped one of the greatest snipers in MGS history, with the sniper rifle of another of the greatest snipers in MGS history, motorboated some jiggle physics, watched one of the most badass scenes in MGS history, and captured a new Pokemon that I wouldn't use for the entire challenge. Kind of. More on that later. Also, kind of bullshit how my soldiers have thermal vision when I don't, though I guess since the night vision goggles kind of have thermals, it's kind of the same thing. All right, Hellbound has us saving Huey skinny penis Emmerich, and off to a great start, I get gunned down before even making it out of the Soviet base. I don't even really want to save this fucking guy, but whatever. Attempt two, I use my normal route that I forgot about because I haven't replayed the MGSV campaign in a minute, and I make it to the base where Emmerich is being held. I primarily used the SOCOM throughout this mission to remain stealthy with my silenced pistol, and it works as I'm able to nab Emmerich without even getting detected. Hang on a second. Mission Let's use the walking gear I developed to escape. There's a special one here at the lab. Only I can activate it, and I'll tell you how to operate it. Nah, I'm not gonna use D Walker. I can't because of the challenge. It is a long way there. Why don't you use that walker gear of his? No, Ocelot, I'm good. I can't use the D-Walker. Aren't you going to use my walker gear? GOD SHUT THE FUCK UP! I WANNA USE THE FUCKING D-WALKER! Anyway, I get to the LZ and almost shit myself as I throw Huey to the ground right as the cutscene starts. This scared me because I know immediately after this cutscene, I'm gonna have to run from a nearly 80 foot tall fucking war machine with opposable thumbs, and I don't want to have to pick Huey's ass back up to run away from him. Luckily, the game does this for me, and, after being protected by the mighty Lord Box, I extract this piece of dog shit. Now, for those of you who have either watched a Metal Gear Solid 5 playthrough or played through the game yourself, you know that to fend off Sahelanthropus here, you have to use Pequod's minigun. And since Snake can't use a minigun in the original Metal Gear Solid, that would have failed the challenge. If not for our prior mentioned technicality. Now, you all have the final say whether my shenanigans here works and the challenge can continue, or if this fails the challenge. But in the original Metal Gear Solid, there is a minigun used by one of the characters, a boss named Vulcan Raven. His minigun is never acquirable or usable in Metal Gear Solid 1, but it is a weapon in the game. So if you see this as a breach of the rules because Snake and MGS1 can't use a minigun, fair play to you. But even if you aren't willing to let it slide, I did. So we've got a Metal Gear Solid to Phantom Pain. All right! Pitch dark! We finally made it to Africa, and what better way to celebrate than to blow up an oil field facility? I decided to go loud for this mission, you know, make a scene out of my arrival to let those rival PMCs know that Big Boss is in town. Yeah, and while heading through this village, I got spotted by and dispatched several soldiers, but at one point, I stumbled upon this. Now, I wasn't sure if what I was looking at was a small, crouching soldier, or a child soldier. So I figured, well, there's only one way to find out. A child has died. In hindsight, that may not have been true. There may, in fact, have been a different, better way to find out. Boss, you killed a child. Amazing. Mission complete. That right there is why you're the best, boss. The one and only. I decided to go loud the next attempt, but maintaining stealth to avoid annoying children, just like at my job. I make it to Mafinda Oil Field and just shoot my way through. Making use of C4, I take out the tanker and move on to Lingua Franca to rescue the Viscount. Making use of my SOCOM and stun grenades, I abduct the interpreter, but this stunt changes the situation to going loud, which gets me fucking killed. 
Round two, interpreter stunned and kidnapped once again, and this time I stay hidden despite unleashing a sniper wolf special on the enemy. I rescue some non-Viscounts and scan some shit and learn the locations of the remaining hostages, but I also get spotted, finally. POW saved, POW saved, and Viscount saved. Footprints of Phantoms is a bit of a difficult mission for my current setup, so I guess this mission is more affected by the challenge than any other thus far, as I've got to destroy some walker gears in an encampment full of soldiers in full ballistic armor. So my only really useful weapon is, of course, my hand grenades. The FAMAS isn't strong enough to take on the camp, the SOCOM ain't built for armor and helmets, the PSG-1 does okay, but not against an entire army, and so, after accidentally committing suicide, I go with my old reliable. CQC and fucking dying. I then double down on the PSG-1 like a moron until I remember to bust out the grenades. Salvaging this shit show, I complete the mission and start Trader's Caravan to steal a truck full of lung cancer. Guess starring the Skull's Parasite Unit? That can't be good. It's been a while since I've run this mission, so I go and get the info for it, but my usual tactic is to head to Mafinda, which is right next to where the trucks have to pass in order to escape, use Phantom Cigars to get the trucks to show up, blow up the tanks with C4 to get the trucks to stop, which I can do since both of those items are allowed under these rules, kill the Skulls, and dip. I do try that tactic once, so let's see how that plays out. Let's see Paul Allen's card. Enemy presence. The map has been enemy presence detected. The map has been updated. Enemy presence detected. The map has been updated. Mission failed, boss. I saw those trucks pass during the cigar laps, and I was like, fuck, no. <laughs> Since my OG tactic didn't work and I didn't want to spam small cigar tokes, I decided I'd shake things up. I tracked down the convoy and engaged the skulls with my FAMAS and, well, got blown the fuck up. Next attempt goes much better, until it doesn't, because I blow the truck the fuck up. You know, if the game didn't force me to have to take the fucking truck, I could have saved hundreds of my Kikongo speaking Conrads. Guess their blood is on your hands, game. Anyway, after a long, drawn-out slugfest where I ran my FAMAS dry, my PSG-1 dry, and finished them off with my SOCOM, the Skulls fell and we acquired the W. Now for everyone's favorite mission, rescue the Intel agents! Yep, definitely not filler. Definitely not more filler than Naruto and Bleach combined. It didn't really take long, and I kind of remembered where everything was. GG, Snake saves Intel agents low diff, Snake solos, young boy better. Okay, I'll be real with you guys. Blood Runs Deep is my shit. I've run this mission probably nearly 500 times. See, I didn't know about the combat deployment mission you could send your soldiers on to get rid of Devil Snake when he's covered in blood and shit, and I was really tired of always being covered in blood and shit. So I tried farming Blood Runs Deep for good karma. That wasn't going to ever fucking work because I had made a nuke. So I had fucking insane amounts of negative karma. Suffice it to say, I had some... Mixed emotions when I found out a single combat deployment solved a problem I had wasted in excess of 500 hours on. Anyway, you guys can see that this is probably my most perfect performance out of any mission as I yeet the commander without so much as being smelt. I roll through the captivity area, but I do get spotted once at the worst possible time when I'm no longer in a position to unalive the guy who sees me. So that blows. After unfortunately not murdering the children for money, I at least get to knock them the fuck out with a stun grenade, wormhole Fulton them to not have to deal with the rest of this janky-ass mission, and disappear into the night unseen and unheard. I definitely did not shit my pants there. Cos beats children like the tsundere he is because he's a gigachad, and we're on the trail looking to kill the major. The only major. Ever. In all of human history. I guess. I follow... I don't know, some guy, I'm not really paying attention because this is all just filler. I tried to force the issue so I could just move on from this mission, which resulted in the deaths of at least 20 men in the most comical way I've ever seen. 
Finally, after inspecting literally every individual dead body for some reason, the guy left, I followed him, found the one and only Major, the most memorable enemy in Metal Gear history, let me remind you, and I blow up his helicopter with my PSG-1. E-Z. Hey guys, I hope everybody's enjoying the video so far. If you are, let me know by leaving a like and maybe consider hitting that subscribe button. It lets me know that this is content that you guys want to see in the future and that it's okay if I keep doing it. Also, if you're feeling particularly gracious, maybe consider subscribing to my main channel if you're not already. We cover a bunch of anime content on there, particularly Grappler Baki, so if that interests you, go ahead and give it a look. Also, if you're looking to keep tabs on what I'm up to, you can also follow me on Reddit, and if you're looking for a community of goofballs to interact with every now and then, including myself, you can join the Discord. Alright, intermission done. Back to the video. Episode 20, Voices. This mission is one of my favorites because it does horror atmosphere so good. I mean, I felt like I was playing PT, which is actually kind of funny because there's a PT Easter egg on this mission. And yeah, you know what? I'd probably enjoy it a little bit more if I wasn't constantly being eaten alive by wild African dogs, but I'll take what I can get. The entrance being hidden in the jungle, the fog, the overall silence, the eeriness of the name Benzoya Badiabulu, the devil's house, and the horrible insides, all culminating in the horrible reveal and, of course, the Vulgan boss fight. Literally one of my favorite lines in the entire series, and I'm not kidding, is Kaz's line when Snake barely escapes death at Vulgan's hands. Kaz is almost always composed. He gets depressed and he gets frustrated sometimes. But he's always composed to some degree. The break in composure in this single line shows the total shock and absolute sense of urgency from a largely stoic man. Well, I take that advice. Not before setting myself on fire, but I don't slow down a single bit. I do the tunnel explosion thing and foolishly call Pequod while hidden, causing Vulgan to out of the sky! I bait his ass in front of a tanker and blew his ass into a big puddle of water. His mortal weakness. As a reward, I get to tell a child his friend is dead and take a smoke break, also like my job in real life. A sundowner favorite, the mission War Economy just asks me to off a CFA official. This was actually surprisingly easy. I remember having trouble with this mission when I first played through the game, but I snatched the arms dealer and killed the official in like two minutes. Alright, so now I gotta take back Mother Base, thanks Kaz. And it gives me a bit of trouble, but not because of my equipment, just carelessness and skill issues. Twelve minutes and two attempts later and the enemy commander gets popped right between the eyes, the last thing going through his mind before he died being a bullet. We're over the halfway point now with the White Mamba, where I infiltrate a village of child soldiers and just lob stun grenades at Eli like a fastball World Cup class pitcher. I'm pretty sure I gave myself drain damage with those stun grenades, so I'm willing to bet that Eli's brain is a pink, peptabismal-like liquid leaking out of his ears by now, which kind of explains some of his... odd future decisions. Unfortunately for youngest Boyus, I gotta break his arm. Huh. Being Solid Snake in this cutscene kind of foreshadows a bit. Neat. Anyway, after Eli realizes that he is not him, I gotta babysit two fucking ba- I mean, rescue two civilians in close contact. I don't mind that all these missions are narratively insignificant and narratively carbon copies, like rescue two whatevers or eliminate the dingus or whatever because the actual mission itself, in terms of how you go about it, is totally different every time. It's just another chance to play more of this fun-ass game. Well, I more or less go loud and accidentally get support from Pequod. I don't like getting air support and want to limit it, if at all possible, because of course you can't call an attack helicopter for help in Metal Gear Solid 1, but I do need an LZ extraction. So if he decides to prioritize elimination of enemy threats, then there isn't much I can do. But of course it isn't that big of a deal anyway, since I would have either killed them myself, something I could have easily done at that point, I believe, or run away, something even easier. Time for Captain Ahab to aim true ye vengeful. Yet as badass as that sounds, I'm really just toking and curveballing some stun grenades at children. If they can smell purple afterwards, they only have themselves to blame for being forced to be child soldiers and kidnapping a corrupt military official. Well, I save said official and save and stun basically everyone else in the entire camp as well, including the commander. And myself. Now I'll be hunting down a human trafficker, so elimination mission, but I get to feel morally justified. The FAMAS immediately comes out, and after gunning my way through some nobodies, I get the 1980s Google Doc for the gross man's location. After that, I use my night vision slash thermal goggles to suss out the smell of human filth and body him and his entire clique. In root cause, I snipe an entire village of enemies and save this stupid-ass IFA guy before he drives himself off a cliff. 
Whole thing from sort to credits didn't even take 10 minutes. Finally, we're back to plot relevance and beautiful cutscenes with Code Talker, where we gotta save old boy from half-naked, jiggle physics, supermodel-looking quiet clones, and a mansion? Is old boy fucking serious? Are you kidding me? So this cloak skull fight was probably the longest I've ever fought simply because I couldn't fucking find them. My PSG1 pretty much tore them to shreds, and I outsniped them even worse than I did with Quiet, but once I pressured them back to the jungle with two remaining, I wanted to, quote, kill them all, but I couldn't find out where they were. Even using night vision goggles to try to find their guns since thermals don't work on their bodies while running around, either I couldn't find them or I would find them and immediately lose them because they'd run away because I ran right into them. In whole, the Code Talker part of the mission took about four minutes, but killing those last two cloak skulls took over eight minutes apiece. Anyway, I did beat them all, and getting the Dene Wobakia head-ass dude was a breeze. Don't celebrate too early, though, because we end up getting jumped on the way back to Mother Base during our Metallic Archaea name drop and exposition dump. Speaking of Metallic Archaea, that's our next mission, where we have to avoid an airstrip of zombies while fighting a gaggle of armor skulls. The battle wasn't too tough, all things considered, but several attempts is enough to tell you that it isn't a cakewalk. Grenade spam didn't work, the FAMAS didn't work, the PSG-1 didn't work. But when I was able to keep myself alive long enough to use literally every offensive item I had, it was enough. The FAMAS, the PSG-1, the SOCOM, the grenades, the stun grenades, the C4, everything. And even that almost wasn't enough. Three attempts later and we're back to living in my garage explaining why Azura foot worship should be the main religion of Morrowind. We then cure the men at Mother Base of having children. Oh, and of the vocal parasites. And then we also bully Huey a little, we do a little bit of trolling, and then we set out to take vengeance against Grimace wearing Zoro's mask. I almost perfectly sneak into OKB Zero, only getting spotted at the very end, but still making it to my highly anticipated 20 minutes of cutscenes with little danger. Or fun. Psychomantis literally hits the Andy Woody meme, swapping Volgan's hatred for liquid snakes, and Volgan decides to follow Lotir God's advice. Finally, another mission that is usually pretty easy, but was actually kind of tough in this run, the final boss of Chapter 1, Sahelanthropus. He's normally pretty easy to kill, but that's with vehicles available, with more air support available, and most importantly, usually with stronger weapons. Four-star weapons certainly aren't bad and have served me well up to this point, but Mission 31 is where all of that changes for the worse. I even brought Killer B, but it didn't make much of a difference. Only plus side, Skullface is burning up! Well, this Snake vs. Metal Gear boss fight is a little different from what I remember, but the beats are still there. I die via falling off a cliff for the fucking second time this playthrough, got Railgun one shot, got one shot blown up by a rock three minutes later, but avoided dying to the Railgun again, shot a child and didn't get in trouble, and defeated Metal Gear Sahelanthropus. Then me and my homie almost kiss and decide to go torture a disabled person. Not Huey, another disabled person. No, it's okay, I'm friends with a disabled person. Just to be clear, no, I don't count this as using a weapon other than the ones allowed, because not only can I just skip this cutscene and it doesn't happen, but it's even less consequential to the run than when I use the skull machetes in the CQC QTEs while fighting the skulls, and I don't count that either. If you do, get bent. Also, funny I mentioned low tier god earlier because Kaz becomes him for a second and then we take off. Also, fuck Huey. Me and all my homies hate Huey. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we've done it. We've built the strongest independent contract army on Earth, defeated Skullface, recovered Sahelanthropus, and completed Chapter 1. Still got Chapter 2, though. What, you thought we were done? Kaz literally gathers all the remaining plot-pertinent characters and gives a badass, dramatic, cataract-showing speech just to tell me we gotta keep going. Well, from a ton of back-to-back -back story and cutscenes and plot-filled missions with lots of action and excitement, to know too much sets up the expectation for Chapter 2 as some boring-ass unnecessary shit. Go get CIA guy. Here I thought coming back to Afghanistan would be fun, but I literally just run up to dude, extract him, and dip. Cursed Legacy? Also kinda boring. I go back to the Africa Code Talker mansion and extract some containers. I think the hardest part was just a lot of the enemies were fully armored. Extraordinary, more like anything but. Just run up to Sugma Keep and grab an ancient relic of the past called a VHS tape. Be kind and rewind, what the fuck is this? Proxy War Without End, just another recycled harder version of Back Up Back Down. Emphasis on harder, see I failed this mission quite a few times. 
First, I came without Killer B and had to restart after getting fucked. Then I actually did alright with C4 and the Killer B, and I even scooped up a tank. But my difficulties began with this last piece of dog shit, dookiest, doggiest, wateroniest gunship. With the rocket ammo I had left, I wasn't able to take it down, so I tried emptying every bullet I had into it, and while it looked like I was close, close don't mean shit. I tried exfiltrating and using Pequod's minigun, but I got fucking annihilated instead. Next try, I called in Pequod for a heli fight, which lasted nearly 15 minutes and resulted in my death via random soldier gunshot. Then like five minutes later, I died just by being mowed down by the gunship. Finally! I bit the bullet and called for an ammo resupply. It's not against the rules, but it does push those limitations. So I really didn't want to, but this won't be the last time I have to make this concession. Should have just stopped at chapter one, but no, I had to throw myself into the eternal misery and torment of hell itself. Oh, but before we throw ourselves into that hell, the ammo resupply was too late, so I FUCKING DIED AGAIN- What's it that they say? Tenth time's the charm? Alright, that hell I mentioned earlier. <laughs> time for the last mission, the worst mission in the entire game, and the cheesiest, shittiest garbage I've ever had the displeasure of playing in a long time. A quiet exit. First this mission takes my waifu, then it takes 10 years off my life. So Quiet turns herself over to the Soviets and we gotta go pick her up from the Lamar Kahate Palace sleepover because she's scared. I usually listen to the radio while I play this game, but this time I get to run to the palace with exposition dumps playing soothingly in the background. Meanwhile, something really gross happens that results in one man having his spine snapped in half, one man getting Mike tyson one man becoming one woman, and Snake just watching this whole shit show take place like, we gotta go, I just saw a tank roll over that hill, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go! Also, glistening titties. So this was absolutely hell. Even with the six-star Killer B. A lot of the tanks were extremely tough to shoot at without getting blown up or shot by these fucking crack shot jackholes. My first death may have been a kind of dumb one, rushing and flanking a tank while enemies are behind me, but trust me, I smarten up and nothing changes. Second go through, things are going better. While grabbing some ammo, I very nearly die, but I managed to clutch up and stay in the game. The recipe was simple. Peek, lock on, shoot, duck, relocate. Then, wave two started. Holy mother of god, I died so many times here between attempts that were in excess of 10 minutes apiece, I was literally sweating by the end of things. The arms of my PC chair will never be the same, I warped them with my Yujiro Hanma demon back strength. The anti-air tank was easy enough, the ATP trucks were easy enough, the fucking bane of my existence was this tank. It is literally more accurate a shot than any sniper in Metal Gear. Some of the shots it pulled off were literally some camel through the eye of a needle type shit. Attempt 3, and that tank has become my number one focus. I get an angle on the anti-air tank and right ATP, snatch the left ATP like a thief, retreat into the palace to combat my mortal enemy, and get obliterated by it while trying to destroy the right ATP I apparently didn't manage to finish off. Attempt 4, I try to go sky high. I rocket and grenade the easy ones, and mortal combat begins. Or so I thought before being attacked by the right ATP. I ignore it and begin the actual final boss fight. I actually managed to kill this fucking super tank, and I only have one ground vehicle left. Ground vehicle. The right ATP gets in my way of victory, so it's grenaded to death, but now I have to finish this fight by downing a gunship. And I fucking explode and die in one hit! I don't even know what killed me, whether it was the gunship, a tank I missed, or the fucking ghost of the super tank, but it doesn't matter because I am dead. Attempt 5. It's becoming harder to even kill the ATPs. Without standing that I got fucking ambushed by the new skull unit, Shield Guy. Tank goes down, ATPs go down, fucking instant death. Attempt 6. The tank literally destroys me in its first and only shot. Attempt 7. I take to the roof again, kill the ATPs, and get blown up and killed by literally nothing. I don't understand, I was literally at the back of the building with no enemies in sight, so unless that super tank is so good he can fire a missile through a building and directly into me, I just got wall hacked by a ghost. Attempt 8, I try to cut them off. It works for the ATPs, I run back to the palace, try to fight the right ATP, wall hacked by the tank. Attempt 9 is where I get smart. Yes, it took nearly 10 attempts for me to think of putting down traps, or rather thinking I needed to. The trap works for the left ATP, but I was off on the right one and have to grenade it to death. I then engage in the most intense game of window peeking in history, and I was victorious.
Next, two more tanks had made homes of my front lawn, so like any crotchety old man, I went to go confiscate them. And like any crotchety old man, I was shot by the owners. We've reached uncharted territory in double-digit attempts. I engage in brutal war with the right ATP, and my reward is falling to my death like a fucking moron. Attempt 11 is like a new release of the classic hits. Anti-air dies, ATPs die, one gets kidnapped, and I get wall-hacked by the super tank. I'm starting to feel icky with the amount of times I've said wall hacks. Like some Dorito-munching, Mountain Dew-chugging cod scrub. Well, that might be because I am all of those things, but attempt 12 is the one. The one where I immediately die. Again. Attempt 13 sharpens up my trap game. The right ATP is offed by the C4, though the left one somehow survives, so I finish it off. My new plan is to use the solid and invincible cover of the rocky terrain to avoid being wall hacked. It was a good plan, until it wasn't. Shame too, that plan was actually doing okay. Attempt 14 and inching ever closer to attempt 20, I try to flank the tank to the left, and the left ATP reminds me that it exists to stop me from doing that very thing. Attempt 15, I get my revenge on the ATPs and decide enough is enough. I'm already pushing on my limitations hard with this mission since I'm forced to have Quiet as a buddy, which I justify by reminding myself that I wouldn't even be here if not for Quiet but those tanks just gotta fucking go. Two bombardments do it, and after engaging with two ATPs and killing one, I call in the boy Pequod to win the day. In hindsight, I'm kind of surprised I went with this tactic instead of thinking to use the stealth camouflage that I am allowed to use to just... steal all the ground vehicles. Whatever, at this point, if you consider using bombardments and air support as a breach of the rules, I lost a long ass time ago, I just wanted to play Metal Gear Solid 5 as Solid Snake, using some weapons modified to be like weapons in Metal Gear Solid 1, and thought it would be cool to run a Metal Gear Solid 1 themed challenge. It was never meant to be as restrictive as it was fun. Anyway, me and Pequod piece up that fucking gunship, and after using Pequod as bait, And under the cover of the sandstorm, I literally just yeet the last two tanks to Mother Base. And with just a mere five attempts away from 20 fucking attempts, I complete the final mission of the run. B-rank my fucking dick. Anyway, Quiet saves me, disappears forever, sadly, makes me sweat out of my manly masculine eye sweat ducts with her final monologue like she always does, and that's the run. Thanks for watching, guys. I've always really loved Metal Gear Solid V, and for all the shit I give it, it's probably one of my top five games to release in the last two decades. So much like my friends, I roast the shit out of it because I love it. I plan to do more runs of it in the future, runs like beating the game as Grey Fox, Raiden, Naked Snake, etc, etc. But one thing I'd like to ask you guys is if that's something you'd like to see. And if so, do you want me to play through the whole game or just chapter one? Chapter two is kind of mid, and if I'm being honest, playing a quiet exit every time I do a run is going to kill me in real life. I won't want to do the runs as much because that mission isn't fun, and it's what I'll have to look forward to at the end of every run I do. Anyway, let me know all that stuff in the comments down below. My next challenge run planned is a Fallout 4 run, so be on the lookout for that. I hope you dudes enjoyed, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.